Jalen and Jacoby, The After Show is presented by State Farm. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Jalen and Jacoby, The After Show is also brought to you by AT&T. And now, Jalen and Jacoby. Welcome to Jalen and Jacoby, The After Show. We are joined, as we always are, by the director of The Last Dance, Jason Hare. Jason, how does it feel right now? It feels fantastic because you pronounced my name right for the first time in five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, it's bittersweet, man. It's, uh, you know, something obviously we, we've been looking forward to this moment forever when the whole thing's going to be done and there's no more work to be done. Um, but I, you know, I thought I'd be with the team. We all thought we'd be together. So that's tough, but there's people going through much, much, much tougher stuff right now. Um, I, I liken it to a graduation, like a high school or college graduation, where for years you're saying, I, I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to get there. And then when the graduation actually comes and you're saying goodbye to your friends and, and you're, you're driving away from campus, it's, uh, it's emotional. It's sentimental. This is a huge chapter of my life um, that started officially in January 2018, unofficially in July of 2016, and in many ways all the way back to, to when I was eight years old. And first saw Michael play. So it's, it's a huge chapter in my life. Um, so there's a, you know, we're proud that we got this on the air in time. Um, we're relieved that it's done and there's no more work to be done on it, but it's, it's bittersweet because I'm going to miss uh, the, I'm going to miss making the story. I'm going to miss the people that I work with. Congratulations, Jason. We've been captivated every Sunday since the last dance started airing. So I want to be this guy. Now that we've seen each episode, we're clamoring for more. So was there ever talk of instead of doing two each Sunday over five weeks, maybe doing one each Sunday over 10 weeks? And possibly is there room on the cutting floor for episode number 11? There was discussion of doing every every mathematical formula you can think of of how to roll this thing out was discussed and, and one a week for 10 weeks was discussed. Um, we also discussed doing uh, five per week for two weeks in a row ending last night. Um, mm. And then we, and then we discussed like doing four in, in, in the end of uh, March when they were ready and then waiting a month and having four more come out. Ultimately it was decided to do um, two, every week for five weeks. And that's why we did it. As far as I'm very confident there won't be an episode 11 um, because this is where the, the story ends there that the, the, the uh, where more content would have come in is in earlier episodes. We had to hit 50 minutes every single week or every single episode um, for the 10 chapters of the story. So we, some of them deserve to be 70 minutes. We, we could have told, a lot more about Dennis Robbins' backstory. A lot more about Scottie Pippen's backstory. Phil Jackson's story deserves its own documentary. Steve Kerr's, as you saw in episode nine, we only spent about eight minutes on that. I could tell two hours of stories about Steve Kerr and how he came up. And then, of course, there's Michael's story about George Kohler is is his best friend uh, in the doc. And that was Michael said, call him my best friend because that's mm-hmm. what he is. He met George because he came off a plane when, when he was uh, a rookie. had never been to Chicago. Couldn't find the car that was supposed to pick him up. And George was a limo driver. Couldn't find the fare that he was supposed to pick up. He went up to Michael and said, hey, aren't you Larry Jordan? And Because <laughs> he had played with a guy named Larry Jordan. He got the name screwed up. And Michael said, no, that's my brother. I'm Michael Jordan. So he said, all right, let me give you a ride to your hotel. And whatever, 36 years later, they're, they're best friends. So there's tons of stories that we could have told early on, but, but we, had to, uh, we had to get this thing done. One of the things that I've really enjoyed about this is someone who was is of an age where I watched all of these games and I lived through all this, but there's so much that I didn't retain as a memory. And sort of when you look back on it in hindsight, it's like, well, Michael Jordan dominated the 90s, and it just sort of felt like in your memory that every single season he laced up his sneakers, he won the championship and the finals MVP. But one thing that this documentary has done for me is just reminded me just how highly contested the league was. And there's just that – while the Bulls did win championships, they were pushed so hard by these other dynasties and these other teams. And do you think that part of that is maybe one of the reasons that Michael Jordan decided to do this now? It's just to kind of remind everybody that he is the GOAT and that it wasn't easy and that he did dominate. I think that that would come from a place of insecurity with him. And, and I've never met anyone less insecure than Michael. 
So <laughs> maybe you'd have to ask him that. I haven't spoken to Michael since since the last time we interviewed him in December, and I'll probably never cross paths with with Michael again. That's that's just that, that's the professional relationship that we had. That that was it. So you'd have to ask him that question. I don't think he cares about that. I honestly think that he's very comfortable with what he accomplished and where he stands um, on the, on the tower of, of greats in basketball. He has a ton of respect for the people who came before him and really doesn't want to get into a goat discussion at all ever. I think that's one of the things that we established early on was I told him like, this is not going to be a referendum on who's the greatest. That's not what we're trying to settle here. Cause he, he says it's disrespectful not to mention Jerry West and Bill Russell and Kareem and Dr. J and even Marcus Johnson, the guys who, who, who came before him as greats and the guys who influenced him, um, you know, artistically and creatively on the court. So maybe I get that the timing is, is such that, that LeBron is, is now, you know, uh, a rightful, uh, uh, challenger to that throne and that the, that the Warriors, uh, are as great as they were coached by Steve Kerr. Who knows? You, you have to ask him that, but I doubt you're going to get an answer. So as he was doing these emotional joy rides with his interviews, while we can celebrate the championships and the legacy and the greatness, but what about the sacrifices and the pain that comes with being so um, focused on your craft um, he lost his father throughout the process. You just talked about his bodyguard. Uh, what about that part of doing these interviews? You mean approaching the, the sensitive topics? Yes. It's hard because I don't know this person, you know, and it's, it's hard, especially, you know, with, with Steve Kerr's mom, for instance, Let, let's, let's not talk about, talk about Michael for a second, but let's talk about Steve Kerr's mom. And the tragedy that befell that that family. Um, we interviewed Steve in a hotel in New York, and that's kind of like neutral territory. He was in between games with between the Knicks and the Nets. It was a Saturday afternoon. He's coming from a shoot around. He's still in his in his uh, Warriors gear, uh, and that's tough enough to to approach. But at least you're doing it in a professional environment. We went into Ann Kerr's home and we are guests there. We had to take off our shoes and walk around in our socks and make sure we didn't move any furniture out of place. So you're, you're being invited into someone's home. And <laughs> right. To sit there and ask her about the most horrific moment of her life. Um, and she knows that that's where we're going to eventually go. We're going to talk about Steve's childhood and all that, but we're eventually getting to, to, to that moment. So it's difficult, man. It's painful. And then to see, to see these people going through painful moments and you have to, your, your human reaction is you want to reach out and hug them and say, cut the cameras and, and take the time. But you also have an obligation to the viewers to show the pain that these people are going through so that their stories can be conveyed in the proper way. So you have to kind of sit back and it, it's against every instinct that you have as a good person, but you have to just kind of sit back and let the person process through it. So it's difficult. I mean, when we talked about Gus, who was Gus let was the security guard, um, you know, that's, that's a father figure to Michael after he lost his dad, Gus moved into that role. And I'm sure it's painful for, for Michael to talk about, you know, he, he, and he's very reluctant to say these things. He ended up paying all of Gus's uh, medical bills and, mm. and taking care of, of that guy and, and his family. And in so many ways, emotionally, he was there for them. So this is a guy that's family to him. And it feels invasive again for me to be asking about that because I never knew Gus. We interviewed his wife, of course, but I never knew him. It's just tricky because you're a stranger and you're there to do business. And then you're asking these people to open wounds that haven't been opened in a long time. So. Stuck in a home during a quarantine, joining our friends on Zoom calls. We all know there's a lot going on right now in the world, and we're all shopping online as we stay at home. I just saw that AT&T started doing two really helpful things for those who want to buy a new phone or device online. They're offering fast, free, no-contact delivery and curbside pickup so that online shopping is simple and safe as possible. On top of that, they have a flexible return policy so you can shop at ease. You can visit att.com to learn how to shop online from the safety of your home. 
Sometimes it's change. Restricted the fun. We've been doing this show for nine years. It seems like we've still been having the same debate when it comes to who's the greatest of all time in the NBA. It's the great debate. Who's the best of the best? Who's the real deal of the NBA? When it comes to home and auto insurance, there's only one real deal, and that is State Farm. But Jalen, me and you go back and forth. I don't do the cross-era comparisons because I feel like it's like technology. It just gets better with time, so you can't do cross-era comparisons. But during this The Last Dance run, it seems like the debate has been sort of brought back up. And some tells me I know where you side on this one. MJ, six championships. Six MVPs. Nobody will do that. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Six championships, six league MVPs. Nobody ever do that. He's a light, league's all-time leading scorer. Bill Russell. 11 championships, 13 years. That'll never happen again. LeBron is great. He deserves to be on Rob Rushmore, Mount Rushmore. You can fight me for this next one because he's my favorite player, Magic Johnson. I think he won five championships in 13 years. You can fight me on that one and give LeBron his spot. But for me, LeBron got to win one with the Lakers to pass Magic. But if you want to put LeBron at fourth, three championships, 17 seasons, three teams. The other people just accomplished greater achievements in the NBA. Well, obviously I disagree, but whatever your opinion may be, there's only one thing everyone can agree on. There's nothing realer than a teammate you can rely on. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Jason, um, this has just been such a widely celebrated documentary. I mean, it seems like it's it's like an event every Sunday night. And everyone's on different group texts, getting texts from their different friend groups about it. It just seems to sort of like capture the conversation. And with this wild success of this documentary, naturally, there's going to be those people that have criticisms about it. And I'm sure that you've heard them. But how do you what do you think about sort of someone that says, well, what about his family life? And what about his relationship with his his ex-wife and his children? How come that wasn't put in the documentary? How would you answer that? We interviewed Carmen Electra, who, who was briefly married to, to Dennis Rodman. Um, we originally had her graphic as ex-wife, but we thought it would be, it would be too, uh, confusing. So we interviewed her though, because she was there for a story that was relevant to the 97, 98 season and it affected the performance of that team on the court. This is, this is the, re- it wasn't because she was married to Dennis Rodman. It's because she was there when he went on his vacation. She was there with him when he went to, to wrestle. You saw her there with him. Uh, kissing the trophy after the game. So she was part of that nucleus that surrounded that team. Um, and the family members did not. So if we interviewed Michael's wife or then wife, then this become, then this teeters towards the Michael Jordan definitive documentary. And then we finished the, the story in 1998 and you say, well, if it's the definitive Michael documentary, where's the stuff of him playing for the Wizards? Where's the mm. stuff of him owning the Hornets? Where's the Hall of Fame speech? These guys did an incomplete job with the Michael Jordan documentary. So it's a tough line to, to tow, but the more we did that, the more we would make it into Michael and not the Bulls. Obviously, he's going to be the, the key figure in this story, but um, we tried to keep it, every character that we interviewed, we tried to keep it as relevant as possible to the story of the 97, 98 Bulls, and that was our way of telling the story of the entire dynasty. How about this? And I've noticed it because... He's a legend, an OG, a former teammate, and I love him, Scottie Pippen. And he works with us. But yet this documentary opened up so many wounds that he's noticeably absent and not discussing it. How do you feel his relationship with MJ is at this point? I don't know. I I don't know good or bad, honestly, and that's not me playing dumb I am dumb when it comes to that because I don't I don't know those guys Uh, I know that Scotty was readily available for us and and was willing to do another interview in January we just we were scrambling and didn't have the time to get his son plays at Vanderbilt so we were going to go down to Nashville and 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 interview him just for a few pickups to ask him more about his his bad back for episode 10 and things like that and then the world kind of shut down once we got into late February but I don't know how their relationship is um You'd have to ask those guys. So, Jason, sort of directing something as successful as this and something that captured the the zeitgeist the way that this did, naturally there's the question is, 
what's next? I'm sure your agent's been fielding phone calls and <laughs> people are trying to get at you. Like my daughter's trying to get at me. You can probably hear from the other side of the door. So Jason, my question for you is what is next for you professionally? What's the next subject? Uh, I, I really don't know. I, I have not stopped thinking about this one yet. It's, it's like if you think if you, if you turned a bike over upside down and you spun the wheel as hard as you could, the front wheel of that bike, and it would be going and going and going and going and going. And I'd say, all right, stop, but you have to let that wheel go. It's going to take a while for that to slow down. That's what my brain's doing right now. I barely slept last night. Uh, and it wasn't mm-hmm. out of anxiety. It wasn't out of, you know, ex- excitement. It, it was just my brain was, was going. You're thinking, oh, we could have done this. We could have done that. And, and, you know, just hearing from people from, from the past and stuff. And just my brain is in a million directions right now. So I don't know. I, I, I do want to get outside of sports. I know that and, and, and explore stories that don't necessarily have to do with sports. I'll always come back to sports. I don't know how you do a sports story that's going to, to be more of a, a challenge or, um, but just bigger than this. Because this is this is the indelible team of my lifetime, my generation certainly is the the Chicago Bulls. I mean, it, even the Yankees and the Cowboys, they were dwarfed by this team in terms of their cultural significance in the '90s. So that would be tough to top. I think the next sports thing that I do will probably be the the direct opposite when it comes to fame and, and adulation and and uh, you know global impact. I could see doing a story about a high school team or. Um, something really small, anonymous like that. But I don't know, man. I, I hope that um, enough people enjoyed it, that there's some opportunities um, that I can sit down with someone and, and discuss where we want to go next. I know you will appreciate these analogies, but these this is going to be your reasonable doubt, your Illmatic, your me against the world. That That's what mm-hmm. this is about to be. Your reasonable doubt was Fab Five. Fab Five was reasonable doubt. <laughs> Thank you, family. First Thank you. <laughs> this would be like my blueprint. Right. I like that. I appreciate you. And you're about to win a ton of awards and rightfully so. What is it like for you? And what conversations, whether personally in your phone or friends and family and or on social media, has it been like to introduce a new generation to Michael Jordan who didn't necessarily see him play? but now get a chance to accept and appreciate his greatness. That's one of the coolest parts um, is, you know, the stuff I get from, from just anonymous, like young people throughout the globe on, on social media saying like, thanks, thanks for telling the story. I never knew Like my dad always told me about him, but I never knew exactly why he was considered the greatest. The other cool thing is, is to see today's superstars, young superstars, the Trey Youngs and the Giannis's and those guys mm. saying that they watched it and that they're inspired by it or affected mm-hmm. by it or, or like laughing at Michael's killer instinct or, or, or admiring like a play or a game. That's really cool is to think that, that it makes me feel like an old man um, at 43, but to think that those guys really never saw anything beyond like YouTube highlights and, and, and Instagram clips and things like that, that they could actually, that was my biggest concern. And I, I, I didn't know that we were going to pull it off is there's so many highlights of his, um, and so many great games and great performances and so many great stories like, like the George Carl story or, or, you know, the Le Bradford Smith. There's so many stories like that. How can we fit them all in one and not just have this be a hodgepodge, a mess of a bunch of highlights and, and random stories of Michael getting revenge on people or, or, or creating these, <laughs> conjuring these rivalries in his head? Uh, it's one of the reasons why early on in the series, I was adamant about having those montages in every episode, like the rookie montage to rock him, just to remind people, even my age, what he looked like as a rookie and how different that was from anyone who was playing the game at that point. Like Rakim when he came out. Exactly. Um, that was dope how you did that. And then Prince, um, young and old gather around, everybody held a new king in town and, and party man. That The late 80s Michael Jordan might be the most entertaining athlete of my lifetime. Agreed. Uh, and putting as many highlights as we could in than that. We could have had that be a seven minute montage to a remix of that song and it probably still would have been uh entertaining. But I I you know, what's lost is like the stories like the dunk contest against Dominique and things like that. There's mm. there's still there's so many more stories to be told. So I was just afraid that we wouldn't hit any of those or not enough 
that young people would understand um, his greatness and how incredible it was to watch him play. I also think it helps that this 97, 98 footage, I was thinking of this last night when I saw how beautiful that film looks when it's up yeah. and it's color corrected. You get an idea, like anyone who says he's playing against plumbers or whatever, like Jalen, you're not a plumber <laughs> and you weren't playing against plumbers either. Um, <laughs> And you saw, by the way, we showed you sticking one from the top of the key. I, I appreciate that. that. Had to do it. You know there. what I'm saying? Lost all of the mid range. That's a needle. I one appreciate that. that. How did you find yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was thinking, like, I'm so glad that that film looks so rich and that it looks like it was shot yesterday, so that people can understand, like, the the Davis brothers and Carl Malone. My girlfriend was saying Carl Malone is huge. Yes, and I was about to say, like, well, he's you know, other guys are big today. There was a shot of him like from the back, and you he's see he's massive, he's mm-hmm. enormous. <laughs> yes. Um, so these dudes were killers. I, I, I can't speak as much to maybe '84. You can say some of these guys were 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 a little bit slower than the guys are today to put it nicely, but 98, man, no way. When you look at those, I, I agree with Reggie that on paper, certainly, even he said when you guys lost in, in seven, he said, I still think we had a better team, but they had that championship DNA. I mean, top to bottom, we didn't even get to, to Travis Best and Austin Crozier, I think, was on that team too. They had a, you guys had a, a squad on that team. So, and that was top to bottom in the East. That's why I think, when people say, even when Michael says that they would have won, uh, they could have won a seventh, it would have been tough, man. It would have been and, very tough, especially if Dennis didn't come back. I think Dennis was the X factor to all those second three P teams. I agree. And also, so dominance in the NBA after Russell was able to do it, it really kicked in in the 80s when Magic and Burr were able to do it. And then championships were bookend by Dr. J and the Bad Boys. And then in the 90s, Jordan had his turn and sw- uh, took all of the championships off the table except the two the Dream got when he was gone. And then, obviously, it was bookend by Tim Duncan. And so for people who feel like Jordan was playing against Jeff Hornacek or whoever, like you underestimate that those guys would translate. Like he almost reminds me of like a – he he can't dribble like a C.J. McCollum, but he kind of reminds me of that. But the point I'm trying to make is when Jordan retired, the the next champions were Tim Duncan, who got five, <laughs> Shaq and Kobe, who won three straight, something Bird Magic didn't do. So, like, these was real dynasties that was happening, Jason, over that period of time. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it's it's not – it didn't stop with Michael and then these guys came in the league. They overlapped. So as you saw, Michael playing against, I mean, look at that. Look at the all-star game in 98. The guys who were on the floor, the young guys who were on the floor then. I mean, Kevin Garnett was a baby when he was on the floor. These are, these are all future champions. Not all, but, but a lot of future champions there and future dynasties with, in, in, in Kobe's case. So. You know, we didn't even get into AI, and and I, I had always thought we were going to do a, a completely like w- how the league had changed, and I was going to use things done changed big when he came back from, from the show like what the league. Had Remember done. back in the days, mm-hmm. had plays, gazelle shades. Oh, by the way, I just now realized something. I got waves and gazelle shades. <laughs> Thank you, Biggie. This was all one long con for you to have that. <laughs> yes. um, but I wanted to show like how the league had evolved and then how Michael had to evolve his game and, and become more of a back to the basket player and, and, you know, become smarter. Use that. He was almost like a, like a martial artist at that point. Um, then, then just a raw, hungry, wild animal athlete running around out there. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm glad that. You know, this is a question you asked a long time ago, I feel like now, but I am very glad that that the young people from 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 young superstars right now to my nephews who are teenagers can actually see um, just how great he was and just how difficult it was to get there. Seven years before he even got one title. And we remember him as this consummate winner. It took him seven years. Most guys don't last in the league for seven years. And it took him seven years of losing to finally win one. Jason, we've discussed this on the after show 
previously, but I'm still obsessed with this pizza. Okay. <laughs> so you're trying to tell I'm me a pizza guy right here. You're trying to tell me <laughs> that he got food poisoning from a pizza that he got 11 at night. And then he was still feeling the effects the next day. I have a straight up question for you. Were there adult beverages involved in Michael Jordan's evening that evening? I was in college when, when all this went down. <laughs> you just yes. talked to anybody yes. that was yes. in the room. Yes. You that talked to everybody answer. that was in the room. Absolutely. I, I did that not ask where you stomach. were when this happened. I asked anybody you knows if that adult kills beverages your were stomach. Involved. I will, I, I'll say this. And this is, I have no first person account or first person knowledge of, of anything there, but I said it on last week on the last pod that I did with you guys. You don't wake up throwing up at two, three in the morning on the ground, clutching your stomach from drinking. You don't like you, you can, you can drink so much, so many shots that you, you, you throw up in an alley outside of a bar, but you don't wake up in the middle of the night in your hotel room with stabbing stomach pains vomiting uncontrollably and shaking breaking fevers and 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 trembling you don't do that for i I don't care how much tequila or wine or anything you have so (laughs) it's not like an answer to the question though (laughs) because i don't know the answer to the question you know the answer to the question as well as i you now have all the information that i have and he told you he was in college I've never worked in a pizzeria, Jacoby, so you have more information. Yeah, Jacoby, tell us how that works. Well, Why did five people deliver the pizza? Why did he get sick, first Jacoby? Of all, first of all, there's no way five people, because at that time, it's closing time. So you're really two people max in the establishment. So there's not even so five people. So you feel like that's exaggeration? That you feel yeah, like, no like that's exaggeration, people. Jason? Here's what, here's what I think happened. I think a couple of guys in the pizza place came, and I think that maybe guys from the pizza place knew dudes from the hotel. And mm. they said, this is Jordan's room. Can we come up with you and just peek in? Can we see? Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. The five guys were not closing up the shop that night. Like, I don't yeah. know what night of the week that was, but I don't care like what night of the week. Yeah. In, <laughs> yeah. In, 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 on the outskirts of Salt Lake City, not exactly known <laughs> as a party town. The place, the place was not packed with people that they needed five employees. I, 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 I'm surprised there were five people awake in Salt Lake City at that time of night. So... <laughs> I think that if there were five people, if there was more than one pizza delivery guy, what what I wondered is this. Why not go down? I don't know. And get the pizza in the lobby. Uh, Because there's a card game. There's a card game going on. That's (laughs) what it was. They're in the middle of a card game. So let me tell you guys. You're on a hot streak. You're not going down the lobby. Let me tell you guys a couple of things that were happening. Number one, they were gambling, playing cards. Definitely. Number two, they were having adult beverages. Definitely. Number three, any athlete that does that after 11 o'clock, those don't mix. It's going to get you sick. But would you That's do something that? you do in the afternoon. Okay. Jaylen, Jaylen, is, it something, is it something that Michael Jordan it, would do before game five of a finals? Honestly, I can see he was doing, doing it. He was gambling. He was having drinks and he was eating pizza at midnight. He, he he knows exactly what was going on. He knows what time it was. He knows he was there. I think Jalen has something to do with this. Jalen, do you have yeah, Jalen? Yeah, where were you? We know we know Jason was in college. Where, where were you? Well, Howard Isley was playing for the Jazz. You know, yeah. I had a flop spot if I needed one. You weren't uh, you weren't playing ball at that time of year. We don't, yeah, we, don't have, we don't have an alibi. We have no alibi for Jalen. So, uh, Jason. Although this was 10 amazing hours, I'm sure there's a part of you that watches these episodes and says, I wish this was different. I wish it could have got this in. What, what are some of the things that you wish made the documentary that did not? Um, I hate to say not much, but there, there, there's, there, there weren't like big swaths of material that we left out that we cut. I mean, it's, it's, it's little stories. It, it's the story of uh, Mr. Jordan building a, 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 wood stove for Roy Williams uh, when Roy was recruiting Michael because he became wow. such a friend of the family. It's um, Michael's high school coach lying to get him into five-star uh, and and uh, exaggerating his stats to get him into five-star. Dean Smith not wanting Michael to go to five-star because he wanted to keep this secret that he had just discovered at his UNC camp mm. a secret. And Roy Williams and Michael saying that they wanted to fight to go. Michael waiting tables and and serving kids fruit punch in the morning and, and serving them on the court in the afternoon. 
uh, because he, he was on financial aid for that second week and they had, and they had the kids who were on financial aid, uh, work in the kitchen. So little things like that, the Dennis Rodman's entire saga in Oklahoma when he was in junior college and, and coming up, um, we could have told a ton of stories about that. There's a lot more we could have, we had an embarrassment of riches with the characters that were in this thing. Each, each of the characters that we profiled, Ronnie Harper barely has a, a, a soundbite in this. And I feel bad about that. His story is incredible. And I think that Ron Harper, uh, before his knee injury, was one of the most electrifying performers in the Preach. Mm, good point. So, you know, there were a lot of stories to be told. We did the best with, with the exactly 50 minutes that we had for every week. And, um, and that's it. I'm, I'm being told right now that I have to go, though. Well, we listen. We appreciate you sharing this documentary with the good world. Night, and we appreciate you for coming on this show go. and discussing it. It's been so much fun discussing The Last Dance, but we are not done with this project. Jalen Jacoby, The After Show, will continue this Sunday following Lance Part 1. Lance is the story of Lance Armstrong. You hear from Lance himself, and you relive one of the biggest scandals in the history of sports. The Lance Armstrong story. Jalen Jacoby, The After Show, will be right after Part 1 of Lance this Sunday, and we'll continue to do more after shows because we've had so much fun. Thank you so much for listening.